sit on our feet. <laughs> Welcome on board. And thank you very much for being with us tonight. Um, This gentleman needs too much of, a, of an introduction by way of uh, biography. Um, but I will tell you a, a, a little uh, personal story and something that relates to um, the integrity um, and, and the strength of conviction. Uh, as you probably know, uh, this is your Jim's first cop meeting ever. Um, I, I thought long and hard, and I got my courage up and sent him an email and said, Jim, essentially, if there is ever a time when you were needed, it's now. Um, I didn't have to wait too long for that reply. A couple of days later, when he was in, I think it was San Diego at a, con uh, at a conference, some elderly scientist um, dubbed him as the the conscious of the scientific community. And there's no other way to introduce them than that. Thank you, Jim. <laughs> that scientist was Walter Monk, who's now in his 90s and a remarkable uh, oceanographer. Uh, well, I just realized today that I was giving a talk this evening. I thought there was going to be a showing of uh, merchants of Doubt, and I was going to do some Q&A after it, but I guess I'm also supposed to give a talk. So I, I quickly put something together, um, and it will not be a polished presentation, but I think I can make my bottom line clear. Um, and how can I move charts? I just raise them. I, I guess, okay. Um, you know, the, uh, uh, there are three uh, potential injustices. Could I go back one? Uh, so I, I first, I want, I need to decide whether we're talking about climate justice and government honesty or injustice and dishonesty. Um, okay, now the, the uh, go to the next one, please. You, I'm sure you realize the, the biggest uh, injustice is the one intergenerational issue. Our, our parents did not know that they were causing a problem for future generations. But we can only pretend that we don't know. Um, that's why we have to have policies that will actually address this. And that's why we have to look at what they're talking about at this conference. The second one is uh, north-south, where, um, I'm not sure I have a chart or not, but most of the, most of the emissions have been from the north, but the biggest impacts are at low latitudes. I even have a paper that's in, uh, in the process of being published, so I can't really show the results, <laughs> but we show that the, the changes are much larger, actually, at low latitudes. And you're already feeling effects, and that is um, making it actually uncomfortable to live at the lowest latitudes. And uh, so that's this, a second uh, area of injustice. And then, of course, it's one species is causing all of the change. Uh, the millions of other species we potentially can cause the extermination of a quarter to a half of the other species by the end of this century, according to the last IPCC report, and, and there's a fairly good basis for that uh, estimate. Okay, let's go to the next one. So what I'm gonna say, if it's not 
sufficiently coherent. You can, I would suggest that you look at the most recent document that I sent out, which I think was called Isolation of 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. Um, now, go to the next one. Um, and let me just mention one, I'll, I'll just show one figure from a paper which is also in the process of being uh, reviewed and, and published. Uh, what we show is that the ice melt coming from Greenland and Antarctica will have a very big effect. And it's not included in the IPCC models. Um, and uh, we argue that the rate of ice, of fresh water discharge from these ice sheets is a very nonlinear process which is better characterized by a doubling time rather than a more linear a process. And when we look at the data, the, the uh, period for which we have accurate data for the mass loss from Greenland and Antarctica, it's like a decadal doubling time, which would mean that within four to five decades, you've got multimeter sea level rise. And the, the um, surface manifestation of that is a cooling around uh, Antarctica, and that uh, the fresh water makes the vertical column of the ocean more stable. So the usual mechanism by which the ocean, southern ocean, brings heat up, which is expelled to space, is cut off by this freshwater lens, and instead the heat melts the base, the the uh, ice shelves the tongues of ice that come out from Antarctica into the ocean. Now we observe, in fact, this is happening, that the ice shelves are melting faster and faster. And we also observe that it's beginning to cool around the region where the ice discharge is the largest. And um, it's less certain how soon the North Atlantic will uh, begin to cool. In fact, it, it's the last few years it has cooled, but we don't know if that's an oscillation or if that's really the beginning of the effect of the fresh water coming off of Greenland. But that, if we let that happen, that uh, the fresh water become at a rate that's big enough to shut down the North Atlantic deep water formation, the way Wally Broker hypothesized decades ago, then all hell breaks loose because you're cooling the northern latitudes while the tropical latitudes are continuing to get warmer because of the greenhouse gases. And that increased temperature gradient drives much stronger storms. Uh, let's go to the next one. Now, you know, the current emissions, you'll say, well, China is now the biggest emitter. But the chi climate change is not caused by current emissions. It's caused by the cumulative emissions over time. And those cumulative emissions, the United States is responsible for more than a quarter. Europe is responsible for more than a quarter. China for 10%, India 3%, and so on. But that even is an exaggeration of the effect of the developing countries. Because they have the next one. Uh, if you look at it on a per capita basis, uh, United Kingdom is first, and the United States almost the same, and Germany is third. But China is an order of magnitude smaller, a contribution to climate change. And India is barely visible. Their, their, their contribution is so small. Can I have the next one? Uh, yeah. Um, and we're, we are threatening uh, many species for many different reasons. As humans are just sort of taking over the planet. But if you combine that with shifting climate zones, which we will have if we continue on business as usual with fossil fuel emissions, we will cause uh, the extermination of a large number of species. Can I have the next one? Uh, now, we can actually quantify what is needed. If we want to uh, stabilize climate, we need to have, you need to restore the planet's energy balance. What will you do when you add CO2 and other greenhouse gases to the atmosphere is you reduce 
the heat radiation to space because they absorb infrared heat radiation. So there's more energy then coming in from the sun than there is energy going out, and so the planet gets warmer. But we can now, but the planet has only partially responded to the gases we put up in the atmosphere, and we can now measure how far it is out of balance because uh, different nations of the world cooperated in spreading um, more than 3,000 Argo floats around the ocean. They dive down into the ocean because mo this heat has to go into the ocean. The atmosphere is very thin. It has a very small heat capacity, and the continents have a very low thermal conductivity, so the thermal wave only penetrates a few tens of meters. So most of the energy goes into the ocean. We can now measure that the, could I have the next one? The planet is out of balance. There's more, uh, the, the, the heat content of the ocean is increasing. It tells us that we've only felt about half of the climate change due to the gases that are already up there. And we're still increasing more and more. If we, it, it also tells us what we would have to do if we wanted to stabilize climate. And we've already increased the temperature back to the maximum and slightly above the maximum of the Holocene, which is the current uh, climate, 10,000 year climate period that we've been living in, that civilization developed in. So if we want to avoid shooting way out of the Holocene, we need to restore the planet's energy balance. Well, once we know that it's out of balance by about six tenths of a watt per meter squared, that tells us that other things being equal, we would have to reduce the CO2 from 400 parts per million to about 350 parts per million, which is the source of Bill McKibben's uh, name of his organization. Um, that's possible because the ocean and the biosphere and the soil will take up some of that CO2 if we give it time, provided we reduce our emissions fast enough. Uh, could I have the next one? And what it means is that we can only afford to burn a small amount of additional uh, fossil fuels. We've only burned a small fraction of the total fossil fuels in the ground. And the science is crystal clear. We can't burn all of that stuff without creating eventually an ice-free planet and sea level 250 feet higher. You know, so we, can, we know that we can only burn a, a relatively small amount of additional uh, fossil fuels. Could I have the next one? Uh, the next chart. But what's actually happening is that not only are we continuing to burn, this is just the rate at which we're burning. We're, uh, this is energy, but it's mostly fossil fuels. It's almost all um, coal, oil, and gas. Uh, could I have the next one? So, so here's the, the fundamental problem is, and, um, and by the way, I, I've learned you know, I, I worked for NASA for some decades, and the, the highest levels of NASA would always tell me when I went to Washington, make sure you only talk about the science. Don't say anything about policy. That's not your business. Um, what I learned finally was um, the, the reason is that they want to make decisions which are not rational if you're really looking out after the you know, for, for the good of everybody on the long term. Uh, and I think that scientists can look at problems. I think try, scientists are trained to be objective. If, so I've, I've uh, <laughs> decided to ignore uh, that issue. But in this, and looking at this problem rationally, it's, it's very clear. The fundamental problem is that we're going to keep burning fossil fuels as long as they appear to be the cheapest energy. These uh, developing countries, uh, they have just as much right as we did to, to burn fossil fuels to lift their people out of poverty. Uh, but fossil fuels are not really the cheapest energy because they don't include their cost to society. And 
so to address the problem, we need to add a fee to fossil fuels. And you can't do that instantly. It would cause economic chaos if you suddenly uh, quadrupled the price of fossil fuels or something. But you can gradually increase the, uh, the, uh, a fee on fossil fuels. Uh, so could I have the next one? And uh, furthermore, I argue that that uh, fee should be, the money that's collected should be distributed to the public, an equal amount to every legal resident of the country. That way it actually spurs the economy. And it, an economy is more efficient if the prices are honest. Right now, fossil fuel prices are not honest. They don't, they're partially subsidized, but mainly they're just not paying their cost to society. The human health impact of air pollution and water pollution alone would make a large increase in the price of fossil fuels. You have to pay the bill yourself if your child gets asthma. Uh, and then there's the climate impact, which is going to be enormous if, if we allow this to, to continue to go on. Um, and I think the only viable international approach is to say we need a carbon fee. If a few small number of the major players, those being China, the United States, the European Union, would agree to have a rising carbon fee, then you could make it near global easily. They would say that we're going to put a border duty on countries that don't have an equivalent carbon fee. And that would be a huge incentive for the other countries to have an equivalent fee so they can collect the money themselves rather than have us collect it at the borders. So that, uh, unfortunately, OK, let's go to the next one. Now, so and actually, a lot of people are beginning to understand this. And so, as uh, Christiana says, uh, a lot of people are saying we need a carbon price, and then investment would be much easier with, and life would. But she says life is much more complex than that, and so she says we're not going to do that. Well, if that's the case then those three uh, injustices that I started out to talk with, you can count on all of them. You're not going to, what she is saying, and what, uh, what I hear the other international players saying is, oh, we're going to do something, we're going to have, uh, uh, Angela Merkel is going around the world telling people, oh, do like us, we have a cap and trade scheme. Well, I, I made a trip. I, I'd written a letter to Merkel in 2008, and I thought, well, she's a trained physicist. She can understand uh, logic. Um, and, and, and so I wanted to uh, meet with her, but it ended up her advisor, science advisor, said, oh, it's better if you, this letter was, was going to be published. It was translated to German. It's going to be published in uh, Die Zeit, the leading newspaper. But the science advisor asked me to come over and, and speak with the government, thinking, uh, when I got this, but what happened? Could I have the next one? Uh, uh, well, what happened was that they, they simply said, well, it's their, their policy is a cap and trade. And I would say, well, what's the cap on India? And uh, and then he'd say, oh, we'll tighten our carbon cap. Well, the problem isn't Germany's carbon cap, because Germany's now a fairly small portion, you know, 1% or something of global emissions. So how much they tighten the cap? They should do it, of course, since they're one of the three top uh, contributors to the problem. But that's not going to solve the problem. You have to have a, a uh, global approach. In science, when you do an experiment and it's carefully controlled and observed and you see the result, you expect that if you do the same experiment again, you'll get the same result. 
Well, what they're talking about here is the same as the Kyoto Protocol. No global agreement for a CARP to make the price of fossil fuels honest. Instead, get somebody to have a cap, and then why don't you get this other country to do it also? Well, <laughs> you can't do it that way. Uh, because what is the effect? If you reduce your emissions in Germany or someplace else, that makes the fuel less precious. It reduces the price, and someone else will burn it. As long as the fossil fuels are the cheapest energy, somebody's going to burn it. And so reducing it someplace with a cap, you can't, there is no such thing as a global cap, but you could have a global uh, common fee. And uh, unless we do that, we're just, we're, we're just uh, rearranging uh, the deck chairs. Uh, it's, not, it's not solving the problem. Um, uh, do I have any more? Let's. Uh, yeah, so my, you know, unless, uh, unless someone can get through, you know, I tried to, uh, I, I wanted to make this same argument with President Obama, and my wife and I wrote a letter to him, but I couldn't get it delivered, uh, but um, I don't think he understands this, and I think, um, it's um, yeah, it's a problem. This this is scientific. This is rational uh, analysis of the problem. And if uh, now the, what is happening in Paris is that it's been agreed, we're not going to let another Copenhagen happen. We're going to go away from this meeting with everybody clapping each other on the back and saying, "Oh, this we're really uh, doing something now." Um, I don't buy it. Uh, if if uh, if they're all they're talking about is the same old stuff, they're going to get the same old answer. Um, I mean, not to say that there aren't a, a few positive things happening. The uh, investment fund to try to uh, find cleaner energies and make them competitive with fossil fuels is it something we should have done 25 years ago because we knew that there was going to be this problem so it, it's useful that some wealthy people are willing to throw some money uh, at the, the research and development but so there there's some positive things but basically it's still the same old story so i don't care what they say on television tomorrow or next week if this is all they're doing, uh, do I have any? I might have one more. Is that right? No, maybe that was the last one. Okay. So anyway, you know, I'm sorry to be uh, to sound negative, uh, okay. but this is th if we if we go away from here and let them get away with this, you know, we're gonna, in ten years we'll be coming back and it's the same thing. You're going to see global emissions. They continue up, and then I don't see how young people can solve the problem. We'll have pushed the system too far. The ocean getting too warm, it means that we're going to lose the ice sheets, the, the most vulnerable ones in Antarctica, and that means several meters of sea level rise. That means you're going to have hundreds of millions of refugees. We're going to have refugees from low latitudes because the low latitudes are just going to become less and less comfortable uh, for people to live. And you get the more extreme droughts, and uh, so the food supply is, is limited. And, but the biggest thing will be if we let the ice sheets uh, collapse, and there are glaciologists who are telling, every, warning us every time, oh, this, it's getting a little faster. Uh, but that it's important that we get started on this downward path. And the policies that are being talked about uh, are not, are not going to do that. Thank you, James. Thank you very much. Well, I don't think you're negative. You're bringing a solution. Yeah. This fee, this solution. 
Yeah, well, there there is uh, an organization called Citizens Climate Lobby, yeah. which, uh, <laughs> which mm -hmm. has as its sole objective this educating politicians and the public about the merits of uh, a fee and dividend. And you know what? They've done an economic study that shows if you had $10 a ton going up $10 a ton, at the end of 10 years in the United States, it reduces the emissions 30%, creates 3 million jobs, and, uh, and increases the GNP because it makes the economy more efficient exactly. if you have honest prices. Excellent. Um, we are going to show Merchants of Doubt after, after this segment. But while we, we have you here, we, we have a ton of questions out there. So we'll, we'll try to start the conversation now and, and continue it um, after. So, Dr. Hansen, thank you from the bottom of my heart. This is a part question, part shout out. But for those of you accredited to the COP, Dr. Hansen will be doing a press conference tomorrow Dr. Hansen will be doing a press conference tomorrow inside the COP, and I, I hope you can catch the essence of what you've just said in a half hour um, at the COP. So please come at 4.30 in press conference room uh, three, if you're a credit to the COP. My question is um, about the possibility of the Venus syndrome. You've used the words in the past. Can we? actually provoke feedbacks that will extinguish life on Earth. The, um, uh, he is asking about uh, the possibility of runaway greenhouse effect, um, which did occur on Venus uh, because of the Venus being closer to the sun. And to get the runaway greenhouse effect, you want to get the carbon in the Earth's crust into the atmosphere. Um, and um, I speculated in my book, Storms of My Grandchildren, that, uh, that that might happen if we burned all of the fossil fuels. It turns out that's not right. Um, the, but what we can do, uh, we, we still have the, the ability to destroy life on the planet, but to get the Earth, the carbon out of the Earth's crust, the time scale for that is of the order of 100 million years. And this, this uh, CO2 that we put in the atmosphere by burning fossil fuels will go back to the bottom of the ocean too fast um, and get to become carbonates on the ocean floor. And so it's not unlike the brighter sun light on, at Venus. It, which was maintained continually. This spike of CO, human-made spike of CO2 will be too short. Um, so um, you cannot get that runaway greenhouse effect, but you can get enough warming to uh, make life at low latitudes impossible. And uh, all the chaos, and, and then once you have sea level going up, and half, more than half of the major cities in the world are on coastlines. So you could have such chaos that the planet would become ungovernable, and I don't know what's going to happen in that case. <clears throat> Let's go to another question, please. Yeah, uh, Dr. Hansen, yesterday, uh, could, could we, hold on get the mic. Yesterday, President Obama acknowledged our responsibility as the leading contributor to greenhouse gases on the planet. And he made a promise to reduce by 26 to 28 percent, based on 2005, uh, emissions in 10 years. Is that going to be an adequate goal for us, for our responsibility in reducing uh, greenhouse gas emissions? You cannot solve the problem with individual country goals. You actually have to have a, in place a procedure that will cause the fossil fuels to be left in the ground. If the United States reduces its emissions 20% or so, that, that will keep the price of fossil fuels low, and they will keep burning them. 
you know, this is a moment in time when the fossil fuel prices are low enough that we should be adding the carbon fee at this time. The public could, could uh, deal with it, and particularly if the money that is collected is given to the public so that, you know, two-thirds of the people would actually come out ahead. Only the people who are wealthy and fly around the world a lot or have two houses would pay more in their increased prices than they get in the monthly dividend. So uh, it's, it's nice to have gold, but they still don't get it. You cannot solve the problem with individual country goals. You, because, uh, you know, there are 190 countries. And what is your enforcement mechanism? First of all, you're not going to get it. Some of them are simply going to say, well, we're, you caused the problem. We're not going to have any such goal. Uh, so that's nice that he's trying to do that but you know what we really what he really should do is sit down with a thoughtful conservatives and there are still a few I because I know that I've, I've actually met with some of them <laughs> and you know the polit in the United States the politics has become such that we have one party which is just says the science is a hoax and then the other one says it's a problem but they propose solutions that won't work uh, but Conservatives would, I've actually met with some leading conservatives, and they, those who are realize this is not a hoax, they know that it's going to bite them as the public realizes that this was not a hoax. And so they would like it to be addressed with conservative principles, and that is let the market help you find uh, uh, energies that are less carbon intensive and energy efficiency and things by putting this rising fee and as long, and that's they they say that is the conservative approach and so it would be nice if he would sit down with some conservatives and try to come to something because it is going to have to go through the US Senate and you can't uh, you know you can't solve the problem without getting conservatives and liberals on the same page and they are they all have children and grandchildren and and uh, so it's possible, but we, you know, we have to, we have to do it. Do you have any other question? I, oui. I, yeah. Je vais, je vais la poser en français. Yeah. Voilà. On a l'impression d'assister à un dialogue de sourds, en fait, et on est là pour parler d'un autre récit sur le climat. Est-ce qu'il n'y a pas euh, d'autres sciences, comme la psychologie sociale, par exemple, ou d'autres interlocuteurs qui pourraient nous aider à sortir de ce cul-de-sac? How, how can, how can uh, uh, social science uh, be of help in uh, because you s seem to have a, a dialogue with politicians, scientists versus politician. But do you have? I mean, hard sciences. How can uh, social science help? Or do they? Yeah. Um, well, it is a social problem. <laughs> that's for sure. Uh, and how do we get these uh, people? Uh, to uh, to work together. I mean, in the U.S., it's just it's going to pot. You know, the, the 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 it's dysfunction. Our government in Washington is pretty dysfunctional. Um, I I I I don't know. Uh, <laughs> how can how can you change? I mean, how can you change mind? Because when you're talking about bringing the price of fossil fuel up by fee or tax or whatever, uh, you'll have to change mind because you'll have to change the way people behave. And the question is about psychology, you know, global, uh, global psychology of, of people. How, how can they change they, their behavior? Yeah, and the thing is that you, you know, I think that it's, it is an education problem, and that's why the Citizens Climate Lobby is working so hard to write op-eds and, and letters to the editor. Uh, because, you know, you can't say, oh, let's stop consuming so much. You know, if, if there are countries where the emissions are shooting up. I should have had the graph for China and India. where <laughs> Their emissions are, are, are shooting up. Uh, and they have every right to aspire to better lifestyles. And uh, so, what, but they need to be uh, clean energy lifestyles. And they actually want that, you know. And I, 
you know, I'm helping organize a workshop in China, which a week after this uh, conference here, because they they want to find uh, clean energy. They got so much air pollution, uh, so they would like to find alternatives to fossil fuels. But uh, you know, it it is a, we. we our public is not very well educated on this, and it's very hard because in the U.S. you have this constant advertisements. Every every hour you can see a few of them from the fossil fuel industry saying, oh, look at us, we're now creating jobs in the U.S., and we're making the U.S. energy independent, and they're doing it by fracking, and by fracking for oil as well as for gas. And the amount of oil and gas down there is enough to doom our children and grandchildren. And yet, their advertisements are very persuasive. They have a lot of, they've been able to hire the best uh, 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 people you can get for writing these uh, stories. Uh, so it's not going to be easy. I, I wish I had the answers. <laughs> you know, I can, I can see some of these logical things, but the social, social side of it, that's the hard part. Um, yeah. Another question, yeah? Yeah. Uh, those of us who live and work in the South Pacific already see the effects of climate change rise. I mean, houses are being washed away. My, uh, my home village, we can't dig the trees anymore because the water lens is being affected. So we dig down, and we dig the trees, we pollute the water, well water. Now, the IOSIS has been saying 1.5 to survive. Yeah. I'm going what you're saying, but it's too late. Well, it's too late to avoid any impacts. We, we see, um, you know, there's, there's sea levels going up 3.4 millimeters a year, which is a little 14 inches a century. But we, I think we can avoid the really uh, disastrous consequences, in, including the the many meter sea level rise and the extermination of a large fraction of the species. And those are the two irreversible things on any time scale that we would care about. Um, yeah, there's, there's some uh, damage already being done and um, th there's a very good uh, cause for, uh, for reparations. Um, it, it, a suggestion. I was recently in Norway, and and there there were three representatives of three political parties at a meeting put together by friend, Friends of the Earth Norway, and they uh, they liked this idea of fee and dividend, uh, and but they had an, another wrinkle which is kind of interesting, and that is the portion of the fossil fuels used for international transportation air and, and ship, they suggest that should be, the fee collected from that should go to developing countries to uh, fund these kind of problems. And do you know the amount that you would generate that way is, uh, it would solve this problem. You know, they, they, you, you go and ask for this hundred billion dollars and you have a terrible time getting it and then they give it to you in a form which is not real money, it's some credit or something. It's not going to work. You need an actual mechanism to regularly collect money, which and and uh, using the fee from the international transport piece, which is it's only a few percent, but it, it comes out to hundreds of billions of dollars by the time it gets up to a reasonable uh, fee rate. Thank, thank you, Jim. Um, the 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 topic of tonight was be clear. If there's any scientist who hasn't been clear and tried to tell us the truth, um, I, I can't find another. But the, my question to you, um, as we're, we're examining um, how to, to talk about these things in, in a different way, is more about the role of science. I mean, do we expect our scientists to be politicians and policy makers? Do we, do we put too much pressure on on, on the, the methodology of science at the sake of the message. Is, there, is, there, is this time for a new, a new understanding of the role of the scientist? Well, you know, I'm, I'm 
starting in January, I'm going to start working on a book, which will be titled In Search of Truth. Because I think the scientific method, you know, a scientist is trained to be skeptical of his, of his own conclusions. And I was particularly lucky in the, the where, where I grew up as a scientist under Professor Van Allen, where he had the idea, you had to make an original proposition, and, you know, you, and then defend it before five professors. And you had no time to come up with something interesting which is going to be right, because you're not going to suddenly think of a new, new scientific uh, theory and have it be correct. So you could say the moon is made out of green cheese, and then you just you had to say, well, how am I going to investigate this? And, and, you, and um, anyway, so I, I learned to be very skeptical of my own uh, suggestions, and also because I was a shy person, I was always very uncertain. But that's, that's not the way it's working in these sort of things politically. People come with an answer, and then they find as much evidence as they can to support that answer. That's not the way you do science. <laughs> you, are, you have to be very skeptical. And then, and so, and, and particularly in this problem, it covers such a range of things that you need the scientific method and you need to apply it correctly. And then you'll come to the conclusion, oh, that cap and trade is not gonna work. And politician has some reason because it's got a lot of political levers. It lets them give uh, special favors to different people so they like it, but it's not gonna work. Okay. Thank you very much, Jim. Table now for quite a long time. In fact, my organization was, was responsible for again reducing the best right on the table. The difficulty is, is it's not we can't leave it up to governments. Everybody has got to come on board in a way that will tell the, the governments won't change unless people but, tell them. Yeah, and, and the only way to get everybody on board is with the economic uh, push. You know, you can try, you can ask some people, and some people will have better habits and things, but. If you want to get rapid global change, you need the, the economic incentive. Yes, but, but for example, if you take just, I mean, even the IMF has said it, something like 700 billion a year subsidies go to the fossil fuel industry, either directly or indirectly. Now, if that was cut out immediately, you, you could make the change, but governments won't do that until people well, come Most of that big, huge number, though, is in places like... Saudi Arabia, other places. Yeah. They're, they're basically giving away the oil to, to their citizens. Yeah. Uh, but um, what we you need more than getting rid of the subsidies. And it's very hard to get rid of subsidies. Once they're there, the political clout makes it difficult. So the simplest thing is just wipe them out with the fee. It'll overwhelm them. Well, reducing the best is one of those. Have you seen that? Before? I haven't. It's, it's just part of a project called Building the Climate Regime. It's a very simple four page use written by a Swiss physicist called William R. If you give me your card, I'll send you a copy because I think it's, it's more or less what you're talking about, except that it's not it's not the idea of, of like cap and share where you're trying to redistribute money back to the people. Because to do that in a practical way But you didn't but yeah. Yeah. Cap will not work. There's no such thing as a global cap. Yeah. And, you, and you have to have 190 caps on different That's countries. Right. And then even, even but I mean, anyway. So well done. Thank you.